Thank you, Sarah. Uh, I'd be grateful if you could uh, keep your Bibles open or reopen them at, uh, at that uh, section of 1 Corinthians 15. We'll be uh, looking back through it uh, uh, throughout, and you'll find it helpful to be able to follow with me. But, uh, as we begin, uh, let's uh, pray for God's help. Our Father, as we, uh, as we come to your word now and we come to think about the resurrection of Christ and the resurrection of the dead, we pray that you would help us to, uh, as we've sung, to lift our eyes to him, to come and delight to bring him praise. We pray that you might build in us the certain hope of peace, that we might look forward to the day truly when you are all in all. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Since uh, becoming a parent a couple of years ago, I'm be I've been amazed at some of the things that have become an essential part of life, uh, things that in my previous life had little or no role at all, but now we really cannot do without. Uh, we need breadsticks, more breadsticks than you can count. We need wet wipes, lots and lots of wet wipes. We need those little boxes of raisins and at least one Postman Pat DVD at any time. These matter every day. We carry them around with us constantly, my wife and I, and it is a near disaster sometimes if we forget to bring them with us and forget to restock them in the weekly shop. We struggle to function without these things. And the same goes with our Christian life and our Christian faith. There are some things that you cannot do without. And one of them is not the Postman Pat DVD, but the topic of our passage the resurrection of the dead. I have a book at home where in a chapter about the Apostles' Creed, an old, very ancient statement of uh, fundamental Christian truths, the writer in that chapter says, there are some things that a Christian must believe. Non-negotiables if you want to be truly Christian. And Paul says that one of them is the resurrection of the dead. It needs to be front and center in our faith. It needs to matter to us all the time. And in this passage, he gives us three key reasons why that is the case. And the first is this. We're going to go straight forward and to the point as Paul does. If there is no resurrection, your pastor is a liar, your evangelism is a sham, and your faith is a waste of time. Now, having set out the, the heart of the Christian message, the things of first importance, as he says, that the Corinthians have believed back in verses 1 to 11, Paul now picks up with the, the big problem that he's dealing with in this chapter. Now, in verse 12, it seems that some people in the church in Corinth were quite happy to say that Jesus was raised from the dead. But, uh, probably affected by the ideas floating around in their society and in their time, they denied that there will be any bodily resurrection of anybody else. And this is a big problem. Back at Christmas, uh, we bought uh, my little boy Kian one of those wooden train sets, a bit like Brio, but ours was cheaper. And if you're at all familiar, you'll know that the trains and the carriages attach to each other by little magnetic pads, and so they go along the track, and they hold on to each other by these little magnetic pads. And uh, we keep the track and the trains all in one big plastic box. And sometimes, if they're all lying together, if you grab one of the trains out of the box, actually, you don't just get one train, you get a whole bunch of them, because the magnetic bits mean that they all stick together. And so you go to pick out one, and they're all stuck on, and you get loads. And Paul says that's exactly what happens with the resurrection. If you take the resurrection out of the Christian faith, you don't just take the resurrection out, you take everything out. It's a sort of relentless logic to this first section. It's a little, by, little bit like knocking dominoes down. You knock down the resur resurrection of the dead and watch what follows. Verse 13, he says, If, as you say there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ died. Everybody agrees. But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ must not have been raised either. And, verse 14, if Christ has not been raised, 
then our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. Now, this preaching isn't any old sermon. It takes us back to verse 1 and verse 11, where Paul talks about the gospel I preached to you. And in verse 11, where he says, what we preached and what you believed. It is the gospel. It is the fundamental good news of the Christian faith. It is verse 3, Christ died for our sins, was buried, was raised on the third day, and appeared to many people. But if there is no resurrection from the dead, and so no resurrection of Christ, then that preaching is empty. That gospel is empty. The gospel is a fraud. It's not true. It has no spiritual power or value. It can do nothing of any substance for you. In fact, verse 15, Paul and his missionary team and all the other apostles would be false witnesses about God. They would be perjurers. Because we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. They, and everybody who repeats this gospel message, tell lies about God if the dead are not raised. Far from being God's servants, far from being faithful messengers bearing genuinely good news, they... Nick, myself, Andy, in fact, anybody, any of you who have shared the good news with anybody else are liars who shouldn't be listened to. And verse 17, he comes back then to the Corinthians' faith. If Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then, those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. No resurrection of the dead means no resurrection of Christ. And if Christ has not been raised, then sins have not been dealt with. If Christ took our sins on the cross, but God did not raise him, then there is nothing to allow us to think that his death was sufficient or acceptable in any way. Death, the wages of sin simply just claims another life and goes marching on. And our sins still stand over us. And following this, those who have died entrusting themselves to Christ for forgiveness of sins and being raised will be lost. Because they will have gone to the grave with their sins not dealt with. And only condemnation waits for them. If Christ has not been raised then there is no hope for them. No hope of us seeing them again. The last enemy has them. If the dead are not raised, the bottom falls out of the gospel. If you take out the resurrection, everything else comes with it. The truth of the gospel message, the value of faith, the forgiveness of sins, hope beyond death, all gone. We are left with nothing. And verse 19, he says... If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are to be pitied more than all people. And I think it's this last statement that catches us. You see, I doubt there are many of us who think now in exactly the same way that these people in Corinth were thinking, acknowledging that Jesus was raised from the dead, but denying the resurrection of believers But I do wonder whether we have a tendency sometimes to focus on the present to the exclusion of the future. A a tendency to major on how Jesus addresses my life right now. That means that the resurrection sort of fades into the background for us. That we focus on how Jesus helps me to live a better life. How Jesus releases me from difficult and destructive things in my life. How Jesus comforts me in fear and uncertainty. How he guides me. How he provides for me. How he gives me joy. How he died for my sins and deals with my guilt feelings. Now those are all profound and precious truths. But they are deeply incomplete. In fact they are nothing without the resurrection of the dead. 
No resurrection makes them a delusion to be pitied, not blessings to be taken hold of. They don't rest on anything. They have no substance. The resurrection can sometimes feel like a doctrine that I will need when I'm really ill or when the believer that we love has died. It's not really something that matters right now. But it does matter for now, and this is one of the reasons if there is no resurrection, all of the present blessings that we enjoy and value are empty and worthless. Without the resurrection as their foundation, they will simply give way like wet cardboards. But in verse 20, having pointed out the terrible consequences of no resurrection, Paul turns to the the positive reasons why it must matter so much. And the reason is, the resurrection means that there will be a heaven. In verse 20, Paul takes us back again to the things of first importance. He says, Christ has indeed been raised from the dead. It's at the heart of Christian preaching. The Corinthians agree on this point. But, he says, it is this reality that Christ has been raised that demands the resurrection of the dead more generally. Because actually, Christ's resurrection is just a, it's just a part of a bigger whole. It's just a slice of a larger pie. And that bigger whole resurrection is actually some part of something even bigger again. Nothing less than the the restoration of creation and the summing up of everything under God, or heaven, as we call it for short, where God makes everything right. Now, this section gets pretty deep very quickly, but the big idea is this. The resurrection of the dead is non-negotiable because it is central to God restoring order in his broken and rebellious creation. Now, Paul starts with a follow-up statement in verse 20. He says, Christ is the firstfruits of those who've fallen asleep. Now, the idea of firstfruits comes from the Old Testament. Uh, At harvest time, God's people um, would give the, the first parts of the harvest when it first came in as an offering to God. And so it was the first bit that you harvested at the right time of year. And the point was not that they were simply just the first bit, but they stood for the whole of the harvest. They were a sort of representative bit. They were the first part offered to God in thanks and expectation of the whole lot. And Paul says that Jesus' resurrection is like that. In fact, one writer says that it's not so much that there are two resurrections, Jesus and everyone else, but there's actually one resurrection in sort of two episodes. And Paul expands on this again then in verses 21 to 22, and he takes us all the way back to Genesis and to to Adam, the first man, and his sin. And he reminds us that Adam's sin in the Garden of Eden didn't simply bring about the curse of death for, for just him, but that he stood as a representative of the whole human race. He was the family head, if you like. And so he brought death not just on himself, but on the whole family. Back at the uh, New Year, my father-in-law was a bit of a a football fan, and he took me to watch Southampton play Chelsea. And uh, predictably, Chelsea won 3-0, and uh, we were privileged enough to be sitting behind the goal in which the Southampton goalkeeper let in all three goals. Now, he let those goals in, but the whole team shared in the results. Now, the forwards couldn't say, nothing to do with me, I was stuck way up on the halfway line, I didn't let them in, it's not my problem. It's a team sport. The whole team shares in what the goalkeeper did. And it's the same with Adam and us. He sinned and death came for him and for the whole human race. But Paul says that it is exactly the same way with Jesus and the resurrection. For those who are part of Jesus' family, connected to Jesus by faith, his resurrection reaches forwards to us. He is the head of a new family. He is, if you like, a a new start, a, a second Adam 
in whom God is undoing the, the fall itself. And so his resurrection means not just life for him, but also for everyone who follows him. But in verses 23-24, Paul clarifies that there's an order to all this. Each one in his own turn, he says, Christ, the first fruits. Then, when he comes, those who belong to him, then the end will come. When he hands over the kingdom to God the Father after he has destroyed all dominion and power and authority, all powers that stand against him. Now there's this order because the resurrection of Jesus and the resurrection of the dead don't simply stand as events on their own. It's not just nice that Jesus was raised to life and it's okay because our sins are forgiven and then we can be raised as well and that's, that's just all nice and we can enjoy it. They are the start and the, the heart of God's final victory when he sums everything up, when God makes everything right. They are tied, in fact, to God renewing creation. You see, Jesus' resurrection sets in motion his reign as God's king, God's Messiah, and the, the bringing to heal of his enemies. And verse 26, he says, the last enemy to be destroyed is death. And this demands the resurrection of the dead. You see, if there is no resurrection of the dead, then God's enemies have not been finally defeated. And God's reign will not finally stand unchallenged, and everything will not all be made right. But Christ has been raised. And that has set in motion a chain of events that will finally end in God being all in all where the whole of the created order will joyfully submit to him, where people will no longer be threatened by the destructive power of everything that stands against God. But what does this have to do with you? Well, everything. Because this reminds us that the, resur the resurrection of the dead is not a, a second-rank doctrine we cannot just take it or leave it. It is not to be left in the roof space of your faith all year and then just taken out at Easter and sort of dusted off. It's huge. It's at the very heart of God making everything right and everything new. There will be no new heavens and new earth. There will be no final righting of wrongs without the resurrection of the dead. But the fact that there will be means that we can have real and solid assurance that there is a heaven. The idea of everything being made right is not simply a hope that we can kind of hold on to where we go to the grave trying to be optimistic. We can be sure about it. Because the resurrection of Jesus, which has already happened, has set these things in motion. The fact that he has been raised and the fact that there is a vital link between his resurrection and the resurrection of believers, of Christians, means that death is not the great unknown for his people. He has been there first. When I was at Bible college, I did a placement at a small local church for a couple of weeks. And while I was there, I helped the, uh, the minister with the funeral of a, a man who was a uh, a faithful Christian, he'd been part of the church there for many years. And we went to visit the man's wife, and uh, she told us that on the night he died, uh, just before the paramedics took his body away, she went in to see him one last time. And her final words to him were, I will see you again. The resurrection of Jesus means that there was nothing fanciful, nothing sentimental about what she said. They were not the words of a grieving widow just desperately looking for something to hold on to. They were the words of somebody who knew what the resurrection of Jesus means. Well, in verse 29, Paul comes to the third reason why the resurrection of the dead is non-negotiable for Christians. And that is, uh, thinking that there is no resurrection will make Christian living pointless and lead to sin. On the rare occasion that uh, my wife Katie has uh, been away overnight on a Friday without me, I found that uh, I 
uh, sometimes end up reverting to my old student habits and in particular staying up late. And you get to a certain point, if you ever do this, where reason says that you should have gone to bed about two hours ago and uh, you're tired and you're not really concentrating on the DVD you've put on and you're just sort of staying up late for the sake of it now. And you know that being up this late won't actually do you any good tomorrow. And you find yourself wondering, why am I doing this? And that's the question that Paul throws at the Corinthians in verses 29 to 34. He takes two examples of Christian living and Christian practice, and he asks, why would you do it? Verse 29, if there's no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? If the dead are not raised, what possible reason can there be for these things? Now, I know what you're thinking as you read this. What's baptism for the dead? To be honest, I'm not sure. Uh, This is the only mention it gets in the New Testament, and Paul doesn't exactly expand on it here. But here are two possibilities. Uh, He could be using the, the term, the dead as a picture of those people who believe in Jesus and receive baptism, their their situation before they were Christians. Uh, Other places, Paul talks about us before we became Christians uh, as dead. And so the idea is that our bodies are dying, and in that sense we're dead, but we are baptized in the hope of being raised as Christ was raised. Now, another option would be to to understand the original language to read, uh, and it certainly can be understood this way, baptized on account of the dead. Uh, Throughout this passage, if you go all the way through 1 Corinthians 15, the dead, the phrase the dead, uh, refers routinely to Christian believers who have died. And the idea is that those who are baptized on account of the dead are people who have heard about these Christian believers and how through faith in Christ they will be raised to new and glorious life. And so these people who hear about it then themselves believe and are baptized because they too want to share in this new life. They are baptized on account of the dead. Now either way, the basic idea is this. For baptism for the dead to mean anything, It requires a belief in the resurrection of the dead. Otherwise, it is just pointless and empty ritual, and there is absolutely nothing to be gained from it. And the same goes with Christian suffering and Christian endurance. Paul gives us a quick tour of his own ministry. It's one, he says, that regularly involves danger. In fact, death is a real possibility for him. In verse 32, he characterizes his time in a place called Ephesus as facing wild animals. He, he, that is, he faced dangerous and predatory opponents. We've just finished reading through the book of Acts in the 20s and 30s Bible study, and what Paul went through is truly striking. He overstates things here to make his point, I die every day. But to be honest, if you read through the account in Acts, he's not overstating by much. And he asks, if the dead are not raised, what have I gained? His ministry and his efforts and all that he's gone through make absolutely no sense without the resurrection of the dead. Why undergo such danger for a message that can't can't save people? Why face such hardship and give your life to that if there is no new life beyond it? In fact, there's no point. I was watching a comedian on TV recently, and at one point in his act, he said, I don't believe in God. You only go round once, so I'd like to try a bit of everything. And that's the conclusion that Paul says that you have to come to if the dead are not raised. If there is no new life waiting beyond death. If, in fact... God's great purposes for creation won't come to pass and death will still stand strong, then you may as well eat and drink because tomorrow you die. It is the living life to the full idea that is such a virtue in our society. This is all you've got. Have as good a time as you can. 
And it seems that a little of this has been going on in the church in Corinth. Uh, you can read some of the early ch- earlier chapters to find out what. And in verses 33 to 34, he warns them to wake up and to stop sinning. They are ignorant of God. That is, they have not understood that God is a God who raises the dead. And this is, this is leading them into sin. What about us? What about our church? Where does the resurrection of the dead feature in our thinking, in our, the, the basic, uh, basic bits of our faith? Is it possible that perhaps we cave into sin or act like it doesn't matter much or think to ourselves, just this once, you've got to try at least once. Is it possible that we have a tendency to give ourselves to comfort and to accumulating nice stuff because we have forgotten in one sense or another that God raises the dead? And what about Christian endurance and hardship? Now, we certainly do not face suffering and the threat of death in the way that Paul did. But that doesn't mean that the task that Jesus gave us of sharing the good news, of making disciples and serving each other, don't take endurance. It's hard work. And if you do it faithfully, it will cost you. Maybe in friendships maybe in reputation, maybe in family relationships. It's not a choice that makes sense if God does not raise the dead. Quite frankly, you could be having a much easier, much more comfortable life without it. I was talking to somebody recently about what you say when you're talking to somebody who's going through a a particularly difficult time and about how you don't just want to sort of trot out the idea of looking forward to heaven because that can kind of be insensitive to somebody's present situation and it can all feel a little bit remote. And there is wisdom to that. We, We certainly cannot just say, don't worry, it'll be all right in the end. But we must never say less than that. The resurrection and the life everlasting are a real and substantial hope. This is a broken world that God is intent on making new. Which means that our Christian faith should always be future oriented. Not so that we ignore the present, but certainly so that we're not just always standing there staring at our own shoes. Christ has been raised. God does raise the dead. There will be a day when we are raised and God is all in all. And so faith and baptism do make sense. Enduring in the cause of Christ will lead to gain. Resisting sin is important. The resurrection of the dead is the foundation for Christian living, the foundation for faithful endurance. There are some things that we cannot do without. Do not do without the doctrine of the resurrection of the dead. Don't let it get dusty. Make sure that it is at the very beating heart of your life and faith. Because Christ has been raised. And we will be raised. And God will be all in all. Let's pray together. We thank you, almighty God, that in Christ there is not simply hope of um, a bit more life after we die, but the great hope, the great hope of our sins forgiven and finally being brought into your new world where all wrongs have been righted. And we thank you that that reality doesn't simply, doesn't only touch the future, but touches us right now. We pray that you might help us to remember this great future that you have for us and that it might drive our lives now, that we might be forward-looking, that we might be determined in resisting sin, that we might be determined in enduring for the cause of Christ. Help us, we pray. 
Help us to look forward to the day when you are all in all. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.